In this video, we're going to be talking about design systems. If you haven't heard of a design system before, it's a collection of reusable styles and components that you can use to make producing software faster and easier. One of the challenges of creating software is the disconnect that exists between design and development. Part of why this occurs is because assets produced by a designer may not be shared in the most efficient and effective way. Additionally, the assets may not be repurposed across other projects, so rework becomes an issue. A design system helps bridge this gap by standardizing and creating efficiencies in how individual design components are shared and organized. Let me show you a simple example to illustrate this point. In this example, a component is being pulled from the design system and shared across channels and applications. The component may be a widget, like a login prompt or a data entry field. The key is that the component has been standardized and is managed in the design system to make it easy for developers to gain access to. This also helps standardize the design characteristics so you have consistency across your applications. I hope this short video on design systems was helpful. Thanks for watching. Okay, we're at uh, time here, so we're gonna go ahead and jump in. My name is Jason Moshe. I'm gonna be your moderator today. I am joined by Robert Gracious, who is gonna be primarily the one going through the presentation, uh, specifically on design systems. So we're very excited to be talking about design systems. It's something that has been growing in popularity over the past few years, and we're gonna be getting into a lot of detail around design systems. So. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, just um, for house cleaning purposes, you can ask questions. The chat line is open. So please, as you come up with questions in your mind, just put them in there and we'll try to get to them at the end. I'm gonna try to allow for about five minutes for questions at the end. So we'll try to time it so we can try to get to your questions. If we don't have time, if we run over, I will respond to you just one-on-one -on -one and answer any questions you have. Uh, so definitely hit the, the chat line here. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna go off camera and then we'll get into the material. So the purpose of this meeting again, or this webinar is to talk about design systems. We're gonna talk about what is a design system, the benefits and how you can get started using a design system and creating one for your own organization. Um, design systems are, very popular right now. We actually just um, rolled off a project with a client where we created a design system for them. There's a There are a lot of design systems on the market that are just open source that you can actually go to and start using a lot of the assets they have. Robert is gonna be showing some of those and talking about some examples and showing examples. So we'll get into a lot of it, um, a lot of the meat around design systems. So we do wanna keep a little bit high level in the beginning. So. For all of you on the phone that are familiar with what a design system is, some of this will be repetitive, but trust me, we're gonna be getting into a lot more detail, um, probably a third of the way in. So we do wanna kind of start light for those people that don't have any idea what a design system is, okay? So I wanna start with just a simple poll. And the first poll is how many of you are planning to implement a design system in the next, three to six months. So, and if you are, that's great. We'd love to know about it just to give us a feel of, you know, something you're definitely looking at and you just want to learn kind of what it is as you go down this path. Some of you probably aren't even considering it and so forth, but this will give us a good idea. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Robert and we're going to get into a lot of the substance here. I'll leave this poll open for the next minute or so, and then I'll close it down. We have one more poll at the end we'll take. Okay, Robert, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Jason, I appreciate it. So again, we're gonna talk a little bit about what a design system is. Um, I'd like to begin by just talking a little bit about um, some of the value and the benefits behind having a design system. So one of the things that is important within a design system is that it ultimately helps you to enable um, both your design and your development teams to create a consistent and better user experience uh, across your products. And it can even be applied to services in some instances, but most of the time it's really applicable to digital products and product design. So 
what does a design system consist of? Well, typically it will include your visual language, component library, your design guidelines, and governance model. So what's important about this is that oftentimes, I mean, a lot of folks have, have worked with brand standards guides or they've had like a UI kit or even a style guide. So if you think about it, a design system is essentially an evolution of that. Um, it's all of those things, but much, much more. And something that I will mention a few times throughout this webinar is that having the actual guidelines on how to implement that design and having the governance that surrounds that is really what separate, separates it from a, a UI kit or a simple just um, style guide, if you will. So to that end, a design system ultimately is giving you a collection or a library of reusable components with those guidelines for usage that ultimately help organization create better products in less time. And that's really uh, essentially one of the key things around the benefits of having a design system and why this has become not just, it's not a fad, but it's really growing in popularity and you'll find that uh, folks are using it across industries. So some of the key benefits that design systems enable is the fact that you have consistency across your applications whether it be you know, products or even websites. It helps you increase your speed uh, to production. So by having that system, you're actually cutting down a lot of your design time. It even helps in terms of your development time and reducing that. So you're able to actually start to get more products out faster and with better quality. So the quality improvements are that when you create a system, it's based upon standards um, and it has all of the different, if you will, specifications or requirements built in. So just by leveraging that library within your products and services, essentially it's really cutting down on the effort or the level of effort it takes to, to ensure quality assurance across um, your products. And in addition to that, it also helps in being able to promote standards. So many design, many companies, whether it's not just the federal government, but even also in commercial, um, have standards around accessibility, for example, making sure that you're 508 compliant. Um, so by baking that in, if you will, to your design system, ensures that you're having standards-based production across your applications. So ultimately, another value, if you will, within the design system is that it creates that shared vocabulary. Ultimately, organizations, and not just the designers of an organization, but all of the product folks too, like product management, brand, marketing, what this does is the design system really serves as that single source of truth um, for design across the organization. So just to give you some examples, and I mentioned this a moment ago, um, because design systems have been growing in popularity, uh, and this is really based upon their effectiveness, uh, there's a number of different systems out there today, and here are just a few that I wanted to share with you. So you can see here, this is an example from Google Material. Um, here's Workday's Canvas Design System, Salesforce's Lightning, um, Audi System. The U.S. government actually has their design system. Here's a sample as well. And then, of course, just like Google Material, you have the old standards like the Human Interface Guidelines from Apple. So as you can see right off the bat, Design systems are not something that's just specific to any one particular industry um, or any type of field. This is something that provides value that's ubiquitous across industries. So what I wanted to do is for those of you that are brand new to design systems, I wanted to be able to go in a little bit more in depth and show you an example from Google Material. So as you can see within this Google material um, homepage for their material design system, essentially you've got an area for design, your components, your iconography. So as an example, if I go into the component section, what you can see is that um, there's all of the different areas here, such as you know, the, the banners, you know, navigation, buttons, uh, various components such as cards or data tables. And within each of these areas, what you're going to find is that you not only have examples of, you know, that particular component, but you also have the guidelines on how to use it. And you can see that what they've done is they've implemented it. So here's how you use that um, component within Android, iOS, or even within Flutter. So in addition to the components, 
you also have um, sort of the foundation for your design. So things such as layout, color, you know, typography and sound. So this just gives you an example of, an, of Google Materials site, which is, and I'll be talking about this in a little bit more, in terms of creating an actual public facing site or a monument site where folks can go and actually use this as a reference, um, not only to learn, but also be able to download snippets of code and be able to use that um, in their products and services that they're creating based upon Google's material. So the next thing I want to do is talk a little bit about, you know, how can you get started? Um, and again, this is really meant to be at, at a high level. We're going to have additional webinars on design systems that will go into more detail in other areas. But this will give you a good overview of what's involved um, and really take you through step by step on some of the key areas that you need to address if you're going to be implementing a design system within your organization. So the first thing that you want to do is make sure that you have a need uh, within your organization and that you can really start to realize the benefits of a design system. So some of the things that are really important uh, and what most organizations find and why they want to implement a design system is because there's various inefficiencies. Uh, for example, having redundancy in the work. Um, other areas that are important are the you know, ability to scale. Oftentimes, design ends up becoming the bottleneck in many companies, and they're unable to actually design at scale. And that, of course, becomes a constraint for development, especially if you're in an agile, like a DevOps environment. Um, a design system for the design side of the house almost becomes the facilitator or the enabler, if you will, of the design ops. And ideally, for, for organizations that are more mature, they have both a design ops that marries and works hand in hand with the DevOps to ensure there are no bottlenecks in terms of being able to produce applications and being able to release those efficiently at higher quality and greater consistency. In this example, um, you can see with Atlassian's design system, how they're able to utilize it across, you know, not only in the areas of brand and ensuring that there's a, a clear and shared understanding in terms of the personality, you know, the writing style, tone and voice, but also they're leveraging their design system across their marketing efforts and also, of course, within the product. So you can see there's a number of different um, aspects, just even in this example, where Atlassian is able to, to, to really um, reap the benefits of using that design system across many different disciplines within their organization. So one of the key things to do very early on when you're creating a design system is to actually create like an inventory or audit some of your applications this is also helpful in terms of both not only understanding, or as I said in the previous slide, identifying needs, but being able to help ver verify and validate that there's a real business case as to you know, why you should be implementing a design system. So an audit is something that um, is typically one of the very first things that you do uh, before you start creating your system, because what this does is it really gives you a, a big picture of, of your current state. And when I say big picture, this is important because what a lot of organizations do, and it's, it's a big mistake, is that they try to inventory everything. And that's really not necessary. Um, it's just, it's um, the best practice and recommendation is really to pick one, no more than three sort of, sort of your key or flagship applications or websites. And then really what you're doing is you're creating that inventory uh, to look at all the different sort of user interface widgets that are out there as well as some of the different patterns that are being used. So in this example that I'm showing you here, and this is, a ve this is just a snippet, um, you can see that there's like three different implementations for settings in terms of the gear and then the wrench. There's also the use of the bell. In one case, it means alerts. In another case, it's like a notification. And even just the sign out and log out in different variations. And even here, where you basically have four different ways that you can expand. So even in a simple example, and this is something that again, if you go and look at one of your flagship applications, um, it's very revealing. It's one of those what we like to call the aha moment that you have with the organization when you're doing this. And, and one of the things that we recommend is so that when you do this audit, that you basically bring this to, you know, as, if you start talking to your peers and leadership, we have what they call like a walk the wall session, where you can start to take these 
create these sort of these boards and put it up on, on, the, on the wall and start to walk across that. And what you'll see very quickly is everyone will realize, wow, you know, I, I can't believe we have this, you know, many different usages across different components and these incons inconsistencies. And so this is a, a little bit of a fun fact, but even before Google had material, um, when they did their inventory, they found that they had 42 different shades of blue. So just simple things like that can be very revealing in terms of identifying those needs. So once you've actually created your UI inventory, what you also want to do is make sure that you start you know, talking to your peers. Go out, talk to the folks that are on the ground, the practitioners, um, talk to customers, you know, in terms of uh, understanding what their needs are, if they've been impacted by quality um, or impacted by, you know, speed in terms of not being able to get things uh, in a timely manner. Really start to build that business case and bring that to leadership so that you can truly inform them in terms of the need and the benefits that a design system will have. And again, if you go back to, you know, some of those common areas about, you know, is there the, you know, the, the lack of ability to scale? Are there quality issues that are, that are happening over and over again? Are, are there bottlenecks where we're constantly having to try to, to rebuild things every single time when this should be something that should be scaled? And are we, are we able to support, you know, development um, and be able to really, you know, again, support that DevOps approach? So getting that support is something that's essential. Um, pretty much in any endeavor, but but with a design system is especially true because the design system, as you probably are, can tell even in the, in the beginning of this webinar, is that this is something that impacts almost everyone within the organization. So it's good to be able to get that buy-in early on. And also this is something that over time as you start to implement the system and you start to drive adoption, you'll want to be able to start having some of those key folks that you can that you can reach out to to help you and champion the cause. So another thing that's really important when you're uh, kicking off a design system engagement is to start small. And what we recommend is really having, you know, pick like a, a pilot project, if you will, something that's low risk, something that will allow you to be able to, um, to really learn in the process where it's not going to be, you know, if you will, along the critical path to start. Um, these things will grow over time and you have plenty of opportunity as you start getting those quick wins and learning to be able to build that momentum and then start to show folks this is where, you know, we found success. But also at the same time, if there's things that didn't work out and you need and you learn from that and you need to rework it, um, then it's something that's not going to be a, a cause a critical problem. So just to give you an example. You know, if you were to start, you know, say a pilot project with an MVP, you know, you could basically go out, start talking to folks, identify those challenges and needs to really, you know, develop your business case, create that, you know, UI inventory and audit, like I had mentioned, so that you can really walk the wall and get that buy-in and support and really identify those areas that you need to focus on. It'll even help you figure out what are some of the key components that you want to start with. And then go ahead and just kick off that system with an MVP. And even when I say MVP, Let's just say that you don't have a lot of folks that can support you. Maybe it's a very small team or even an individual for that matter. Let's say you don't even have access to developer, developers. Well, you can use um, prototyping tools such as like UX Pen or Envision. Um, there's a number of them out on the market today that where you can actually start to build a codeless prototype to really start capturing, you know, all of those key baseline elements or that foundation for that will serve as your MVP for your design system. So I'll talk about this next in more detail, but some of the things that you want to include that are essential is really establishing what your design principles are, starting to um, document your guidelines, figuring out what components you want in that baseline version of, this, of your system, and then start to actually work on the governance. And governance is key, but it's also something that can, you don't want to boil the ocean with that. You, again, you want to start small and build that up over time as your needs grow. So one of the things that I was showing you was like within Google material and the other examples is creating a monument site. And a monument site is really important because ultimately what you're trying, what you, you're going to be figuring out is how will you share, you know, your design system with the world. And what many companies do is 
they'll create an internal system first that will be basically um, really only employee facing, if you will, and then they'll start pushing things out you know, to the public you know, for general consumption. So this is one of the things that you need to think about as you're starting. Um, this is an example of, of Adobe's uh, design system spectrum. And you can see here in the example, like there's areas of like foundation, which I'll talk again, I'll give you an example of that, that that really talks about some of the visual language, your design principles you can see here, um, the different components, um, patterns and so forth. And these are all things just like with material that of course they wanna be able to share with the public because they of course wanna promote usage of their um, particular libraries and really help people leverage those when they're building applications. Another thing that's important is when with a design system is in having that monument site is having a gallery. So this is an example of IBM's uh, design language, their system called Carbon. And a gallery is hugely important because this helps show folks how that design system was actually implemented. Where was it used? How was it effective? What are the things that are available? Um, and how can others best leverage um, the library for their own projects? So having that gallery uh, is, is a very important thing uh, to say the least. In addition, when you think about public versus a private um, site, you have to also think about the needs of like your partners or, or vendors, if you will, that are working within your organization. The design system becomes a hugely helpful resource for them to be able to go out, actually learn about what the design principles are for your organization, have access to that library of components, and also, again, going to that gallery so that they can be better informed and really up to speed on on understanding what you know how they can best align and get started more effectively in working with your organization so what you'll find is that um, most organizations really have a combination of a public facing as well as a private site because there are things um, on on that you want to keep internal in terms of like internal knowledge best practices and various like workflows and processes that are really really only designed for employee consumption um, a lot of times folks will actually use like the Atlassian uh, Confluence or another type of, you know, hub like that to be able to collaborate and store that internal information. So I talked a little bit about design principles and here's an example. Design principles, ultimately, if you think about it, it really serves as the foundation for really any design system. And something to keep in mind is that, of course, there are best practices and there's industry recognized design principles out there, but this isn't about just going out to some UX site, you know, and cherry picking a couple of principles and saying, hey, this sounds good. This is something that's really important that serves as your foundation. Think of it as almost like your true north uh, that guides you in terms of making decisions of how you're gonna be creating the system, what components to include, um, and it really, of course, gives you those parameters around the guidelines that you create for those components. So if you think about it, ultimately, this is something that you need to tailor and choose the ones or create the, the actual principles that best align to your organization's mission and, and your goals. And so in this example, this is from Salesforce's design system called Lightning. And you can see some of their key principles are clarity, efficiency, beauty, and consistency. And of course, if you clicked in that, they go into more detail. Another thing to, to keep in mind is that, and you'll start to see this in the different examples that I'm going through, is that there's that um, there's really no one size fits all with design systems. Yes, there are certain things that you will find in every single one, like you'll see everybody has design, has design principles as their foundation. Everyone has components, you know, that make, uh, they have some type of foundation or visual language um, that ties to their brand and so forth. But in terms of depth, like even with design principles, you see they have four here, whereas you can go to another system and they might have 10 different design principles that they want to adhere to, you know, as their, as their, if you will, their true north. So the next thing, and I just talk, spoke about this a moment ago, is really creating sort of that, in addition to once you have your design principles of that foundation, another foundational element is creating that visual language. And this is typically something that starts if your organization has a brand standards guide, but unlike a brand standards guide, a design system is more tactical. 
right? So it not only tells you, but it shows you and it actually gives you the code and it gives you what you need to implement. So it goes far beyond what a brand standards or a style guide would offer. So in that visual language, you do want to be able to build off of the brand. You want to be able to show, like, for example, how is the logo used? What's an example of tone and voice and the, and the personality, like as you can see from these examples, um, the typography that you're using, the iconography. Um, iconography is huge. It can be almost become a project unto itself. So again, I implore you to, to start small with that as you build. But things around layout, grid and spacing, all of these things that you really want to be able to provide that guidance and then standardize wherever possible uh, makes up your overall visual language. So you can see examples here from the US web design system um, where the visual language around like buttons, styles, here typography um, from you know Google material. You can see some from Atlassian on the brand and personality and the color palette, you know, just really showing all the different primary colors, secondary, and how those are used uh, within Lonely Planet's design system. The next item is you want to have your components library. And so a components library is that collection of reusable assets that really make up um, and I used, I, button is just one example, but it's something that's very typical that folks uh, understand. But it's also the collection of different UI controls that would go into forms, that would make up your navigation, the templates that you have, and again, the code base that's behind that. This is actually pulled from Brad Frost, who, who was the author of the Atomic Design System, which is a very popular methodology in approaching a design system where he's basically broken things out into sort of you can see atoms molecules all the way through pages and what this says is that as you're building think about it in terms of when you're talking about components it's almost like legos where you want to be able to have to find those building blocks but you can combine those building blocks to make more complex components so a very simple component might be something such as an, a text input field but once you start combining that with the label and a particular button, these become sort of molecules and eventually more complex, such as organisms. So you can see an example here from Instagram, how you have the different, you know, sort of individual elements, how those start to combine to create like the header, different search, um, other capabilities. And then as you start to then further combine those, those start to then form into templates and ultimately make your entire page. So by having this modular approach, this gives you that a, a greater deal of flexibility um, and the ability to scale um, across your design system. So this is the other thing that I mentioned earlier that's so important. And again, there's really no sort of one size fits all for how you do this. But design guidelines are, are something that's really clearly separates, you know, a style guide or, or a UI kit from, from a system. And what you're going to find is, is if you go out and start to learn more and explore different systems, that every organization has a varying degree of depth, uh, if you will, for their guidelines. And again, that's something that I encourage you to start small. Um, it's really about, at the most basic level, it's about usage. So rather than just handing somebody a component, you know, it's about telling them how to use it. And equally importantly, how not to use it. So commonly you'll hear those design guidelines referred to as the do's and don'ts of, of how you actually Im, Im, um, implement you know, those particular components. Other guidelines that are important that to include are guidelines around accessibility. So for example, going back to the standards of 508 or even let's talk about um, WCAG, uh, the web content accessibility guidelines. You have different levels. So, for example, with Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1, a lot of organizations, you'll have level A, double A, AA, triple A. Many organizations will say part of our design principles, part of our standards are that we want to be compliant to a double A level of compliance. That is something that is very important and that you'd want to include in your guidelines for each component to be able to show how to implement this to ensure that you remain AA compliant for WCAG whenever your uh, particular component is implemented within your application. So last but not least is talking about the governance. And as I said, this I could have a whole webinar just on the design governance alone. But ultimately, it's truly about like any product that you have, 
you're going to have people, you're going to have the various processes and the technology that's going to go into really creating as well as managing that product. And I think this is something that, if I haven't said before, I think is important to, to highlight, is that a design system is not a project. It's truly a product. And as such, um, you know, it has its own life cycle. And it's something that, again, you're going to want throughout that life cycle, you're going to want people in various processes to be able to help in both that creation and management of that product as it continues to evolve within your organization. So when you think about it, like in this example, I'm showing how the design system is applicable to websites, to marketing sites, the documentation sites, but it also goes to apps. But it just shows you how that can actually propagate around it and then how there's different workflows that are involved. But typically when you start talking about the people, um, the and this is going to, again, vary upon the need and the size and the complexity, but this is an example of some of the typical disciplines and roles that you would have within a design system team. Having a UX designer, user interface designer, front end developer, somebody that can really work on content. And this is even more than just having a technical writer, but I highly recommend having somebody that's first in content strategy, somebody that's really gonna be able to help manage and guide everything around messaging, your tone and your voice. Um, so that, you know, even something as, you know, when you think about something as ubiquitous as error messaging and alerts and so forth, making sure that that's baked in within your system so that you have the right tone and you have the right voice um, when crafting the content that's going to be displayed within the components. Of course, having back-end folks, it's, this is important, you know, even though it's called a design system, this is truly something that's used throughout the organization and everyone collaborates, not just the front end developers, but also working with engineering, making sure you're working with the technology teams and making sure that they have a seat at the table. I mentioned this before, this is essential. There has to be a product owner, uh, somebody that can truly manage uh, the design system um, you know, throughout its life cycle. Again, this is gonna vary. You're gonna find that some groups start very small where they don't have all of these roles that grow into that. And then you even have companies that will have multiples in these different areas and they'll have various teams that are distributed. And, and so that really leads me into the next slide, which is talking about sort of the organizational model. And there's a lot of information out on the web about this. What you'll find is that um, the two predominant models that are out there are either having a centralized team that really sort of keeps everything in house and, and does everything in terms of the creation management workflow and the versioning of the system. The other is a federated model where it's really distributed and you have different teams that all collaborate together across the organization. This is typically, you know, found in like, you know, really large companies uh, that, are, that have that, di that are distributed. What we have found is that um, what's really becoming more and more prevalent now is really using a hybrid model. It's having both this, a combination of the centralized team plus having that federated team. So there's like different representatives. And then the key is being able to make sure that you choose the right level of sort of, of workflow and, and communication to where you know, you're meeting on a periodic basis, whether that's once, once a month, once a quarter uh, type of thing to be able to really make sure that you know, you're checking in on the needs and sort of the requirements, if you will, from the different groups across the organization. Because at the end of the day, you know, again, the design system is not a static document. Um, as a living system, you want to make sure that is it working? Are there any refinements? Are there things that are missing that folks really need um, that's not currently there within our system? So this is really, again, all part of the overall, you know, you know, management and uh, the life cycle within a system itself. Even workflows, this is something else that can really grow. Um, keep it simple. Some of the things that you want to think about in the very beginning are, you know, how do you add a component to the system? You know, what is the process? Are there any particular reviews? Um, are there any criteria or standards that must be approved before it goes live? You know, so will we have like a beta and an alpha version of components? Um, what is the versioning for that? How do we retire components? What happens if something is not, um, you know, widely used? There's not a use case that really validates the use of a component across many different applications. Well, how do we go ahead and sunset that? And as you can imagine, like anything, 
um, best practices are, you know, making sure that you start developing these workflows so there's no big bang and that things can, can be brought in and out um, in an eloquent way that, that really works, you know, operationally. So keeping those types of workflows uh, going are really important. And um, that's just something to, to, to share that don't get overwhelmed by the governance aspects, but also don't ignore it because this is important. And if you don't have a, a, a team that's supporting and you don't have representatives in that organization that help that also are, are affiliated with it, what you're going to find is you're going to struggle with adoption. So having those different representatives, and this is one of the reasons why a hybrid model is, is growing in popularity, is because it's one of those things where just because you build it doesn't mean they will come. You have to be able to, to be able to go out and show the wins and the successes and the value and be able to start having representatives that will help champion and communicate that uh, and be able to, to really promote that throughout so that it does build its own momentum. And once you have the flywheel going in the right direction and it has that momentum, uh, that's that's when you really start to drive successful adoption. So another thing I want to talk about is the technology, and there's many different you know approaches on this, but one that we have found and also has been widely recognized by industry as a best practice is to take a technology agnostic approach. So what that means is don't you know go build your library set like in one language, like say building everything based on React. Uh, because then if you have to switch languages, go to Flutter or something else, um, there's re rework involved. So typically the way it's done is a design system is technology or platform agnostic to start. So think about it in terms of that visual language, creating your color palette, building out those initial components, whether it be like a button or an accordion or whatever it may be, building all of that, say like an HTML5, using, if you will, of, and I say this with air quotes, a vanilla version of JavaScript you with know, CSS or SAS. What this does is it gives you the ability to more easily port those components over to different languages um, so that you're really tailoring it without having to revamp everything because you've built something based upon one particular, you know, the construct of one particular language. By keeping it in that sort of technology agnostic approach just makes it much easier to then port over to the different languages that you need. And what we found is that most organizations, it's not like you go into a particular company, especially large enterprise, and everybody's just working in Angular. You know, you're gonna have different flavors of that. And you'll find that organizations will have different systems like content management, whether it be Drupal, LifeRay, or something, something of that nature where they themselves have their own component libraries. So if you've got your design system, built the technology agnostic, it will make it that much easier to be able to bring that HTML5 over and start to port that into, you know, you know, say Drupal themes, for example. So in addition to having a monument site, um, a number of the different sort of design tools and platforms that are out on the market today, such as Sketch, Figma, Adobe XD, Envision, UX Pen, uh, just to name some of the some of the key ones that are out there will have built-in design system managers within the actual prototyping platform. And so this is also, I've seen organizations do this. We've done this with customers as well, where before we even go to building out the actual public facing site, we help them build up that MVP or that internal site all within, you know, within a prototyping platform and actually manage you know, the color palette, the text styles, putting the different templates and widgets all in place as a prototype first, then use that to help socialize, help that to really make sure that you have, you know, if you will, you have buy-in and you have an agreement on that initial release for what you want in that design system. And then being able to use that to help you, uh, then use that, if you will, almost as, as your guide or your roadmap to actually building out the code um, for the public facing site. This is also really helpful. Um, we've even done this with, within organizations where they have design communities, um, or if you will, almost like a, a, a guild or a you know, community of practice, where this becomes a wonderful hub for them to be up for designers and you know, front end developers and, and various practitioners uh, within design to be able to collaborate and, and share information. So, a great way to low risk, low cost, to be able to, you know, 
take these templates, try out new ideas for new products and so forth, and then do it in a quote unquote safe environment. So just something to think about. One thing that we can talk about in future webinars is that these systems, the DSMs, are becoming more and more powerful and capable. Something that we'll talk about later is design tokens, which design, you know, DSMs give you the ability to create, manage, and where things are headed for design systems in the future is that actually these platforms and the use of design tokens can ultimately drive um, changes in your component library code base. But again, that's something for a, another webinar in a little bit more detail. Hey, Robert, I just want to do a quick time check because we have about five minutes left. I want to make sure we have time for questions. Absolutely. And, and this really brings me to the last slide, which is over the years and working with a number of customers, um, we've, we've learned a number of, of different things. And there's some, some nuggets of, of lessons learned. And I'm not going to read these, but most of these I've, I've really hit upon um, throughout the presentation today. So with that, Jason, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you so that we can take some questions. Okay, great. We, yeah, we had a few questions come in. Before I do that, I want to do one more poll here. And this poll is, how many of you feel design system would be beneficial to your organization? So while I go ahead and publish that, I'll go ahead and read off some of the questions I've received. The first question for you, Robert, is how long does it take to implement a design system? Kind of a typical time frame. So you, in terms of like the MVP that I was talking about, um, where you're using a prototyping, that can be done something like on around a 10 week time frame to just get that initial foundation element done. And that includes even going out and doing your visual UI inventory. However, with that being said, I would recommend um, in order to have a little bit more substance, try to keep your initial release, you know, somewhere within that five to six month time frame uh, for, for building that out, knowing again that there's going to be additional work after that uh, to, to evolve it as a product. Okay, great. And another question is, what are the different platforms and tools to create a design system? I think you answered some of that already. Yeah, th I mean, there's there's so many that are out there. Some of the ones that that are that are really popular are um, Envision uh, is a is a platform for for creating a system, you know, and again for doing the design. UX Pin is also very powerful. You have Adobe XD. Um, there's in in like Envision is in combination with with one of the leading UI design tools called Sketch that's used. Uh, and Sketch can be used to actually create uh, components and actually create those design tokens I, I mentioned earlier and specify those. And um, yeah, there's many different products out there on the market. And what you'll find is that many of these also promote, they're not just like a, um, if you will, just a tool in and of itself, but they really become more of a collaboration platform uh, to where you can start to socialize, share, and, and, and work together uh, on that system. Great, and we have time for one more question, and that is, what's the difference between a brand style guide and a design system? So a brand style guide um, gives you the guidelines and it shows you examples of, you know, how you, what logo usage is, um, the size of the logo, the colors, et cetera, tone and voice. A design system is tactical. It basically gives you not just the guidelines, but it gives you code, it gives you assets, working, um, reusable code components so that you can take that and start to implement that right within your application. Great. Okay. All right, everyone. I think uh, that's uh, the end of the webinar. I will say really quick before you go that we are going to be making this. Um, we are recording this and we'll make it publicly available. You should be receiving an email in around 24 hours with the video. So feel free to share that with your peers or whoever you'd like to. I want to thank Robert for his time and um, putting put into this. We really appreciate it, Robert. And I hope all of you got a lot out of this. And feel free to reach out to us. I think my email is on the last slide. Robert, if you would move over to that. Feel free to email me directly if you have any questions. I'd be happy to follow up with you. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.